Sego, Skenagoha. My name is Steve Loft. I am Ganyangahaga Mohawk of the Haudenosaunee Confederacy. I'm Turtle Clan, and my home community is the Six Nations of the Grand River. I first want to acknowledge what an honor it is to be on Sapmi, the traditional and customary territory of the Sami people. I bring greetings to them from my community, from my elders, from my ancestors. It is an absolute pleasure to be here, and I thank you all for allowing me to be on your territory. <clears throat> I also want to thank the organizers of this summit and the Sami Theater for inviting me here. It is my first time in the country of, known as Sweden, and it's beautiful, I have to say. It's a gorgeous, gorgeous place. I had a bit of a chance to walk around yesterday, and uh, I felt very much at home here, um, partly because it's the same temperature as back in Ottawa, where I currently live. I work at the Canada Council for the Arts. Now, you have a, a Swedish uh, arts council, so I imagine it's somewhat similar. The Canada Council for the Arts is the National Public Arts Funder in Canada. We also have provincial arts councils. We have 10 pr provinces and three territories in Canada. So there's several levels of funding. We also have municipal funding. But the Canada Council for the Arts is the only arts council that has a national mandate. I've only worked there for the last five years. My um, background, um, as was mentioned, uh, is in indigenous arts. Um, I was a curator, uh, a media artist, um, a writer. Uh, so being on this government side of things is kind of new for me and a bit daunting, as it often is for indigenous peoples. Um, we have a tenuous relationship with governments uh, for a lot of good reasons. For us, because we've been oppressed by successive governments over the years marginalized by them, um, very violently oppressed at times. So it's sometimes difficult because I know I work in a colonial institution. I get that. I see it every day. But I work there because I think as much as it's important to work from the outside, it's also important for indigenous peoples to also work from the inside. And I think we've done some good work at the Canada Council for the Arts, and I want to talk about that today. Um, I will mention that Canada has three distinct indigenous peoples. The Inuit, which are the first peoples of the north. The First Nations, which comprise about 300, over 300 distinct nations. Mine, Mohawk, or Ganyagahaga included and the Métis, which is a modern indigenous peoples, um, a history of a mixed race of French and C French settlers and Cree people, Cree being one of the First Nations. But they have their own distinct culture, their own distinct language, and they are seen as a First Peoples of Canada. So First Nations, Métis, and Inuit. The Canada Council for the Arts has a long history of engagement. Well, I'll mention one other thing, even though I started. Um, we use the term indigenous now to encompass all three of those indigenous peoples in Canada. So when I use the term indigenous, I mean that, but I also mean the global indigenous. So all our brothers and sisters and non-binary uh, of those nations all over the planet. It used to be, the term used to be aboriginal, and that still has a legal context in Canada because in our constitution, the three indigenous groups are recognized, um, but they're recognized as aboriginal. So I use both of those terms because it's historical and legal as well. The Canada Council for the Arts has a long history of engage engagement with indigenous arts and artists. For me, that engagement began when I was invited as an indigenous artist and curator to attend a summit on Aboriginal art initiated by the council in 1996. I'll come back to that, but first I want to put the timing of that summit in context. The 1990s were a particular tumult particularly tumultuous time for Indigenous people in Canada. 
the Oka crisis of 1990, which I'll speak about in a moment, um, brought out the long-standing tensions between Indigenous and non-Indigenous people in Canada and was still very much simmering. Now, in 1990, a small group of Mohawk land protectors from the community of Ganesatage, it's uh, another Mohawk community, not the one I'm from, but not far, far away, um, got into a dispute with the local group who wanted to make a golf course on a traditional Mohawk graveyard. Um, the land was in dispute at the time, the Mohawks claiming it as part of the Ganesatage Reserve, and the local community of Oka claiming it as theirs. Uh, the police were sent in. Um, the Mohawk land protectors stood up for their rights, for the rights of their people. Um, a clash ensued. Uh, over a few days, um, it started to escalate. The provincial police were called in. And finally, the army was called in. The Canadian army, for the first time in its history, was called in to defend the nation against its own citizens. What ensued was a 72-day standoff with this small group in, caught up in a, a, a cultural center surrounded by the nation's army for 72 days. I, like so many of us, watched it all unfold because it was on television every day. They wouldn't let any indigenous people in to the community. We tried. So we had to watch helplessly as a small group of Mohawk warriors, men, women, and children, defied the Canadian nation state to uphold their sovereignty. It was devastating, and in its way, liberating. Anger and rage resonated through indigenous communities across the country, and the indigenous art world was no exception. They, we, were every bit a part of the resistance. We were every bit a part of the struggle. We weren't in that, in that encampment. And bless those people who were for standing up for our rights. But the, but the nations came together to support them. Our artists, organizations, and cultural community, as they had always done, responded. Many of us would start to see art and culture from a very different framework, one based on resistance, and as Gerald Visner once coined, survivance. 1992 marked the 500th anniversary of Columbus's arrival in what would become known as the Americas. Now, I could go on a lot about that particular bit of misnavigation and the colonial legacy that resulted from it, but Perhaps I'll save that for when we go for a beer later. I have a few things to say about that particular person. 1992 was a strange, exciting time. So much had happened, and the Columbus Quincentennial was a galvanizing time for good, for good and bad. In 1992, for example, two landmark exhibitions changed the landscape of Indigenous art in Canada. Land Spirit Power at the National Gallery of Canada and Indigena, Perspectives of Indigenous Peoples on the 500 years at the Canadian Museum of Civilization. Landmark because Canadians had never seen this art. It was very much imbued with our cultures, our customs, our traditions, but also our contemporary realities for the first time on a national scale. And 1993 also saw the release of Abenaki artist Alanisa Bonswan's incredible and chilling film, Ghana Satage. 270 years of resistance, which chronicled the Mohawk resistance at Oka. She was the only filmmaker allowed inside the encampment. She was there for the entire 72 days. So what we saw on television was, of course, what the mainstream, predominantly white media, was showing us. It was, of course, through a very different lens than the one that Alanis showed us. She showed us from the perspective of the Mohawks who were inside the encampment. It was a turning point film, and one of the most important films ever to come out of Canada. A Bomb Swan's film would show us all what it meant to be involved and implicated 
in the larger struggles of Indigenous peoples in Canada. What I learned during this tumultuous period was that when members of our communities assert control over their own lives and culture, politically, socially, and artistically, they go beyond oppression. Thus, control of our image becomes not only an act of subversion, but of resistance and ultimately liberation. So, back to 1996 and the Canada, and the Canada Council for the Arts Summit. By then, the report of the Royal Commission on Aboriginal Peoples had been released. The Royal Commission was established after OCA to do, uh, to do cross-country consultations and to make recommendations to the government. A Royal Commission is one of the highest forms of, uh, of government interaction uh, in, in our system. Unfortunately, the 400 plus pages or 400 plus recommendation of that report went on a shelf. Very, very few of them were ever implemented. That document is over 20, it's 23 years old now. And the recommendations in it are just as imperative today as they were then. But the government of the day ignored it. Some portions of government, however, did take some steps. And I'm happy to say that the Canada Council was one of them. The summit was a reaction by the Canada Council to the changing dynamics and discourses of art, politics, and indigenous protest movements of the time. Organizations like SCANA, the Society for Canadian Artists of Native Ancestry, had long pushed mainstream arts institutions of the country to be more inclusive of indigenous arts. And to their credit, the Canada Council responded by inviting over 250 Aboriginal artists and cultural professionals to the summit to discuss ways it might improve its relationship with indigenous cultural producers. It was an amazing week marked by robust, sometimes raucous debate, thoughtful and pointed dialogue and solid recommendation. Here's the thing that made it important though. It was ours. The Canada Council took a step back, asked us to think, reflect, debate and challenge. The council didn't go as far as we asked them back then, but they did do two things that were instrumental in changing the culture inside the council regarding indigenous people. They committed to creating at least one aboriginal specific program in each disciplinary section of council, and, and I think this is even more important, committed to hiring indigenous program officers for each of those sections. So we had 10, uh, disciplinary based sections at the time. So that means they hired 10 indigenous people 23 years ago. So you get that lived experience, that perspective in the council. It's now some 20 plus years later and I find myself actually working at the Canada Council at another moment of transformation and change. As part of our new funding model transformation, the now former Aboriginal Arts Office, which I was uh, in charge of, was tasked with proposing a way forward in defining and establishing a new relationship with Indigenous artists. What we realized, because I already had a team of Indigenous people working there, was that it was time to go from Aboriginal presence to Indigenous space. Time to create a program centered on indigenous ways of knowing, thinking, interacting, and making. Time to recognize the foundational relationship of Canada, that between indigenous people and the settler state. Time to address notions of cultural sovereignty and self-determination. Not based on colonial notions of nation building, but instead engaged in society building, based on the recognition of recognition of indigenous rights, respect for cultural autonomy, and true partnership for a shared future. In the Canada Council's strategic plan, it states, the Council is taking a self-determined approach that respects and appreciates First Nations, Inuit, and Métis artistic expression, cultural protocols, rights, traditions, and worldviews. This will stimulate the work of indigenous artists, enrich their artistic practices, and give impetus to their communities. This new approach represents a fundamental change 
in the way the council funds, supports, and acknowledges the indigenous arts and cultures in Canada. It recognizes the cultural rights of indigenous peoples and respects the concept of First Nation, Inuit, and Métis self-determination." End quote. To this end, the Canada Council for the Arts has embarked on a course of decolonization that charts a way forward in building a new relationship with the indigenous peoples of that land, a relationship that acknowledges our responsibility as a crown corporation of the government of Canada and sets out our obligations based on inherent right, treaty right, and constitutional right. The clearest manifestation of this commitment is the creation of the creating, knowing, and sharing the arts and cultures of First Nations, Inuit, and Métis peoples. We have the longest title too, which is super cool. Um, it was important because we wanted to make sure we named the peoples it was for. It wasn't for indigenous peoples. Yes, it was, but it's First Nations, Inuit, and Métis. That's who we are. Um, we call it CKS, so for the rest of the talk, I'll use that term. An innovative program of Council's new funding model. In a recent article, our director and CEO, Simon Bro, writes, I quote, we have an obligation and a responsibility to transform ourselves to better support Indigenous artists and communities on their own terms. Our new Indigenous program, CKS, will take a unique self-determined approach in which staff and other members of Indigenous communities will determine the way the program is developed, implemented, and assessed. And the following for me constitute the innovative and truly, I think, transformative nature of this. The program is comprehensive. By expanding our view of what constitutes art and culture and its practitioners from an indigenous perspective, we allow for a more indigenous-centered approach that truly respects and honors indigenous artistic and cultural traditions and contemporary dynamics. The program embraces notions of cultural sovereignty that recognizes an art historical and aesthetic continuity centered in indigenous knowledge and practices. Two, the program supports indigenous self-determination. CKS has been developed and is staffed by indigenous people. In doing so, we mobilize and activate the presence of indigenous cultural professionals within the organization as agents of change and indigenous self-determination. I characterize this as the creation of an an indigenous space within the Canada Council for the Arts, a conceptual and pragmatic space ideally placed to support an ongoing and collaborative relationship with indigenous artists, organizations, and communities. The program is appropriately resourced. Often in the past, government initiatives regarding indigenous peoples have been underfunded and short-term in nature. The Canada, the Canada Council has a 20-year history of funding First Nations, Métis, and Inuit and Inuit artists, and is justly proud of the effect this funding has had on the resurgence and vitalization of indigenous art. However, even with this long-term commitment, total funding to Aboriginal artists and organizations continue to lag for a myriad of reasons, some not under the control of the council, others were. With this in mind, the council is committed to an unprecedented, unprecedented increase in funding to indigenous arts through the CKS program and Council's other strategic initiatives that are specifically indigenous focused. This additional funding will allow for greater flexibility in our support of artists and organizations and to strategically develop underrepresented regions, groups, and artistic cultural genres. By placing this emphasis on cultural self-determination, CKS goes beyond parochial notions of designated funding and into the sphere of true transformative social engagement. In developing CKS, it was incredibly important to actualize it within discourses of self-determination and cultural sovereignty. By articulating the program within a rights discourse, we ensure Council's responsiveness to changing societal, societal, legislative, and jurisprudential dynamics, as well as changes in indigenous creative and cultural practice now and into the future. The, the Canada Council, through this program, affirms the following guiding principles. We respect indigenous worldviews and the rights of indigenous peoples as articulated in the United, 
the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples. We support and uphold the principles of reconciliation articulated through the re final report of the Truth and Reconciliation of Canada. So we support artic artistic activities that respect and encourage First Nations, Inuit, and Métis cultural self-determination and the vitality of Indigenous artistic practices and communities. We recognize the distinct and unique place of First Nations, Inuit, and Métis artists in Canada as creators, interpreters, translators, and transmitters of an inherent Indigenous cultural continuity, as well as unique con contributions made to Canadian cultural identity. We recognize and support customary and contemporary artistic practices. We support and encourage a Canadian arts landscape that is deeply ingrained with perspective, voices, stories, struggles, and aesthetics of the First Nations, Inuit, and Métis peoples. We recognize the distinctiveness of the many unique and self-defining First Nations, Inuit, and Métis communities in Canada. And we recognize a wide variety of artistic and cultural practi practitioners within those communities. As the program moves forward, it would be vital to continually assess and monitor it to ensure it remains consistent with, this, with these values. But by doing so, we establish a commitment to upholding customary law and protocol, rights of the holders of Indigenous knowledge, and the authority and agency of Indigenous peoples in maintaining, developing, and protecting their culture and heritage. In this way, we actualized the Council's commitment to Article 31 of the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples, which states, Indigenous peoples have the right to maintain, control, protect, and develop their cultural heritage, traditional knowledge, and traditional cultural expressions, as well as the manifestations of their sciences, technologies, and cultures. Um, including human and genetic resources, seeds, medicines, knowledge of the properties of fauna and flora, oral traditions, literatures, designs, sports and traditional games, and visual and performing arts. They also have the right to maintain, control, protect, and develop their intellectual property over such cultural heritage, traditional knowledge, and traditional cultural expressions. That's a big statement, and I think it's one that's that cuts to the core of what we must all do. The United Nations Declaration goes on to say that states shall take effective measures to recognize and protect the exercise of these rights. I hold the Canadian state accountable to this. It's the only way I can work there. They must uphold these rights. Now I'm gonna take the last couple minutes I have here to talk about conciliation and reconciliation. Um, and I want to read you, uh, as the Canada has just gone through a truth and reconciliation process. Uh, the final report of that commission has been uh, tabled, uh, accepted by the government, and they came up with 94 calls to action, one that was specifically aimed at the Canada Council, as it turns out. But I want to talk a little bit about that, and I'm going to quote from that final report, where the commission says, for over a century, the central goals of Canada's Aboriginal policy were to eliminate Aboriginal governments, ignore Aboriginal rights, terminate the treaties, and through a process of assimilation, cause Aboriginal peoples to cease to exist as distinct legal, social, cultural, religious, and racial entities in Canada. The establishment and operation of residential schools were a central element of this policy, which can best be described as cultural genocide. End quote. Conciliation or reconciliation, it's a problematic term, so I use both of those because many Indigenous people, myself included, don't think we ever had a conciliatory process, so we can't have a reconciliatory process. Uh, conciliation, reconciliation between Indigenous peoples of that land, my land, and non-Indigenous Canadians is a defining issue by fostering critical and creative conversations between um, de governmental departments, external partners, artists, scholars, survivors, and communities, the Canada Council has committed itself to being a proactive agent of change in the ongoing dialogue of conciliation and reconciliation in Canada. Going forward in our, ad in our address to uh, TRC Call to Action 83, which called on the Canada Council, 
to uh, support indigenous artists through exactly what we were doing at the time. So we were lucky, we got one of the first check marks on the calls to action because we'd already begun the process. Um, we must continue to not only support innovative artwork and or organizational initiatives that include dissemination scholarship about the impacts of cultural genocide, but also continue as an organization to learn about and be responsive to the challenges and the possibilities of creating new dialogues, initiatives, and infrastructures that have as a core principle reconciliation and conciliation. Moving forward, we must remain cognizant of the vital work of conciliation and reconciliation in a range of creation, expression, and public engagement strategies to, I quote, ensure the path to reconciliation remains a national conversation of relevance to us all. This is a time of transform, transformation and change for the Canada Council and I hope for a country in the process of hopefully re-examining its foundational makeup. We have a government that has affirmed the rights of indigenous people of, this land, of that land and moved to address the complex and long-standing barriers to a true nation to nation relationship. Arts and culture must play a role in this evolving narrative. The Canada Council, as the National Public Arts Funder, can and must continue to innovate within that narrative. In our Indigenous communities in Canada and around the world, Indigenous peoples will continue to assert their social, political, cultural, and inherent rights and all along the way, accompanying them in their resurgence, their survivance, and into their future will be the artists. It's an ongoing generative process, but one that we must all be committed and proud to be engaged in. Thank you very much.